What is going on, gunfighters? Welcome to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about guns, gunfighting, tactics, ammo, ballistics, defense, all the right way with God Almighty at the center, Judeo-Christian values, and real-world first-hand experience. Today is a Q&A episode. There are questions from you guys. Now, I could be wrong. This could be the first episode you've ever listened to, but likely not. So I'm not going to put in a long version of the bio today. I'm just going to say, first and foremost, I am a Christian. God is number one in everything that I do, and this podcast is no different. I've been blessed to be a professional gunfighter most of my adult life, combat veteran, military law enforcement, private contractor, state rifle and pistol champion, All by the grace of God, because God gave me those talents and abilities and kept me breathing when other good men died. And I hope to use the blessings and talents he's given me to serve you. With that, let's roll into some Q&A today. Alright, the first question of today. This one's dropped by Todd Ruff. What do you think about CZ USA shotguns? Okay, they are made in Turkey, but I found them to be reliable. Here's the thing about Turkish shotguns. Of all the different kinds of Turkish guns, I am least trepidatious about Turkish shotguns. Shotguns are low-pressure guns. There really hasn't been a lot of new designs in common shotguns, pump-action semi-autos over the past hundred years. There have been some advancements, sure, but... Let me also say that I really like CZ. CZ makes some really good guns. That being said, these... Obviously, they're not made by CZ unless there's this Turkish plant in CZ. I think they're made by some company and stamped CZ. And let me say also, this is not unique to CZ. Winchester, their pump shotguns are made, guess where? In Turkey. Also, Weatherby. I believe Weatherby shotguns are made in Turkey. Now, I don't know if all their shotguns are made in Turkey, but I believe that some of their shotguns are made in Turkey. Weatherby, that is. Many, many What you would think of as American companies have shotguns made in Turkey or have other things made in Turkey. Like Winchester, their 22s, their their Wildcat is made in Turkey. So all that being said, can Turkey make a good shotgun? Yeah, they absolutely can. Not all Turkish imports are made the same. Of all the different types of shotguns, I would trust a Turkish like pump shotgun more than I would trust, let's say, a Turkish copy of a 1911. They're a simpler machine. And one of the big things I question with Turkey is their quality control. I would hope that CZ and Weatherby would implement good quality control. Now, any any manufacturer, Colt, Smith & Wesson, right, any of those guys, even that make stuff in American, occasionally you can get a lemon. I've had bad Glocks right from the factory. Yes, that's a real thing. It really happens. Not all Glocks are 100% reliable all the time. But quality control is a big deal. I would hope that those manufacturers, and CZ is a top-notch company, would have good quality control. So I wouldn't be that worried about the Turkish shotguns as a machine. In fact, the CZ Bob White is a really nice, slick, side-by-side shotgun. And I'm actually not aware of any good American-made, affordable side-by-side shotguns. That being said, Turkey is a majority Muslim country. Majority Muslims adhere to the Quran. If you've ever read the Quran, and I have, is that something you want to support with your money? Some of that money is going to Turkey. So if you take the human element out of it, the machine, a CZ shotgun is probably okay. you got to decide for yourself the ethics of the Turkish-made stuff. Those are my thoughts on the CZ shotguns. This one's from Bnut2100. Any thoughts on sticky type concealed holsters? No clip, soft rubbery, neoprene, general shape with trigger coverage. So my thoughts on those kind of holsters, I've used them a lot over the years. Not this exact style, but I use, I believe, a DeSantis. Let me pull it out of my pocket. Yeah, DeSantis. Similar to the sticky type holster. It's got a slick inside interior and a more grippy outside exterior. I think there's actually a sticky brand is what he might be talking about. Anyway, I think they're great. I normally carry a full-size fighting handgun, although today I did not. I went to the barber. Normally my wife cuts my hair, but uh, she hasn't lately. She's been a bit busy. So I went to the barber today and I knew I was going to take off my jacket and my outer shirt. 
It just seemed easier as I was going to the barber to put 357 Magnum in the pocket. That being said, I have years and years and years of experience. Normally, I carry a full-size fighting handgun, strong side, 3 o'clock. That's better for sure. But if you're carrying in a pocket, yeah, for sure, carry in a holster. And carry in one of these kind of holsters is not bad. It adds very little bulk and weight. And actually may help conceal the firearm because it hides the edges and contours of the firearm. I think they're fantastic. They're a good, low-cost, decent option. This one's from Dylan. Is there a use for a recce rifle east of the Mississippi? Now I'm a bit jaded on this because uh, if you guys don't know it, long story short, my wife has a childhood friend. She's in the hospital, been in the hospital for a long time. She has two small children, age three and five. So my wife came back east to help with the kids and she's still in the hospital, been in the hospital, I think for well over a month at this point. You might even hear the little, little, uh, Toddlers toddling around yelling in the background as my wife my wife wrangles them. But I'm east of the Mississippi right now. I don't think there's any use to live east of the Mississippi, to be honest with you. But if you're gonna, yeah, a recce rifle makes sense. A recce rifle is not a sniper rifle. A recce rifle is a all-purpose, general-purpose rifle. And although you may never get a shot past 200 yards east of the Mississippi, you may need to make a headshot at 75 yards. And a headshot at 75 yards can be as tricky as a full body shot at you know, 300 yards. Let's say you're, you've got a very small shot opportunity to like somebody's taking cover behind a vehicle and all you can see is half of their head. A recce rifle makes a lot of sense. A good general purpose, let's say 16 to 20 inch barrel, handy, LPVO. Yeah, I think it's an exquisite rifle for, for anywhere. A recce rifle is supposed to kind of be a do-it-all as much as an AR-15 can, AR-15 rifle. So yeah, I think a recce rifle absolutely can make sense east of the Mississippi. Not meant Again, it's not meant to be a DMR rifle. It's not meant to be a sniper rifle. It's not meant to be a CQB rifle. It's meant to be a good general purpose AR-15. And I think if you're going to have one AR-15 east of the Mississippi, west of the Mississippi, north of the Mason-Dixon, south of the Mason-Dixon, or as I have come to notice... It's being back here, the Dunkin' Donuts line. If you're going to be north of the Dunkin' Donuts line or south of the Dunkin' Donuts line, you, if you're going to have one, have a recce. Next one's from Alan B 89 Long-time listener. God bless your work and endeavors, assuming my ducks are in a row. If I don't have the funds for both night vision and thermal, which should I get? First of all, I'm going to say probably neither. Probably neither if you don't have a year's worth of food. Odds of you needing to eat are far higher than you needing nods. Um, and I have experience with, I don't have to, you know my bio. But here's the thing. Talking about good times, not super useful, like regular times. Unless you just want to use them. But most people live in areas where there's other people, which means artificial light, which means not super handy. Thermals can be even in daytime for like thick brush and things like that. But here's the deal. You have to be able to engage, which means you need a whole other apparatus to shoot with these things. Also, you need a lot of training. There is a lot of training that goes in the military of driving with night vision on. And if you just think it, this, I think a lot of people are in this gun space, this gun culture, to just buy cool trinkets. If you just want to buy a cool trinket, then just buy one. But if you want to be effective, you have to train a lot. And you shouldn't be training with night vision unless you are really squared away with normal stuff. Meaning for just iron sights and optical sights in the daytime and white light at night. Even though we had night vision and access to night vision and thermals and all the stuff, most of the time for doing stuff at night, the best thing is a white light doesn't have to be uber cool and and you know from some sci-fi movie just a white light is usually better for most things if you have a ton of training running a white light at night with a handgun with a long gun and you have had training on how to navigate with night vision i'm just talking about walking around right it's hard to walk at night with night vision it's really hard to drive with night vision it's really hard to walk and shoot with night vision so unless the, all those other boxes are checked i would say neither if you haven't gone to a couple of professional firearms training classes before you worry about dropping you know how much money on nods or even more on thermals and ways to shoot them with your rifle take a good training class without the stuff 
more practical skills. How about this? Can you shoot your long gun right and left handed? Can you shoot? Can you shoot with either shoulder? Can you navigate? Understand basic urban warfare and cover and concealment geometry? If you don't understand that, you have no need for knots or thermals. Like those are far more practical skills. One more practical still been to a, like an emergency medical class where you can do a shooting drill and then run a tourniquet and apply a tourniquet to somebody without them dying. I think that is far more likely than night vision or thermals. I'm not saying they have no place, but I'm saying if if that stuff is not squared away, you need to square that stuff away first. I mentioned this stuff takes batteries, and a lot of times it takes specialized batteries. I don't trust things with batteries normally. Even in good times, I like to have backup iron sights, backup redundancy. I'm going to run a red dot. I like it to have some kind of backup. Either I just rip it off and throw it away when it, when it breaks. It has solar-powered backup or tritium fiber optic. You get the idea. I don't trust them in good times. So that's a lot of money to drop on something that may or may not work. Even if it does work post-disaster, it's not going to work for very long because you need batteries and a lot of times specialized batteries. And those things suck batteries. So again... Probably neither. But if you have all the other stuff squared away, you got a year's worth of food, you've taken quite a few tactical training classes, you've run, you know, urban warfare type classes at night with a white light, you can shoot either hand, you can, you know, at any given point in time, running a shooting drill, throw on a tourniquet on yourself or somebody else, and you have all that squared away, you can apply a, ch a sucking chest seal, and you want to get night vision or thermals, and you're asking the question, which should I get? What do you want it for? Do you want it for engaging, like meaning shooting something, or do you want it for navigation? Because in my opinion, uh, night vision is better for navigation, like driving at night or navigating, doing a foot patrol in the desert, in a forest at night, night vision. You can still see and engage enemies, but much like if they were in camo during the day, they're going to be camouflaged at night if you're wearing that. Whereas that camouflage applies less unless they really know what they're doing with thermals. But it's hard to navigate with thermals. So are you getting this to drive out of the city when the peanut butter and chocolate hits the fan? Then get night vision. Are you getting it to do a foot patrol around your property at night? Then get night vision. Are you getting it to engage multiple targets or identify targets at night from a fixed position? Then get thermals. Uh, those are my thoughts on thermals versus night vision. This is from Dylan. I don't know if it's the same Dylan or a different Dylan. Would you ever recommend a 1-6 scope for a general purpose AR-15? And would you recommend any optic for an AK pattern rifle? Okay, so two questions here. Let's take them one at a time. One to six, sure. I usually prefer one to four. I've almost never wished I had anything more than a one to four. I prefer one to four. One to six is fine too. In general, you can get a one to four, and this is why I say that, that's not obese. Like a one inch tube, sleek, svelte, doesn't interfere with the handling of the rifle. Most of the other ones are like a 30 millimeter tube or a 34 millimeter tube. I just find them a bit obese a bit girthy more than i would like i prefer a small sleek and really rugged one inch tube one to four than a bigger one to six I, again i've almost never for this type of thing wanted anything more than four power i think it does more harm than good slowing you down so i recommend a one to four but a one to six is fine would i recommend a one to six yes i would recommend a one to four first i would especially recommend a one to four 1.5 to four loophole those are good optics. The VX Freedom and the other lines, the VX Freedom, Freedom being the most affordable one. If it's for this, for like a recce rifle type setup or for a go-to AR, I actually prefer the Hogplex. It's called the Hogplex just because it's got different holdovers and it's got like a crosshair with a donut around it, which kind of acts as a crude, really big front sight if you're driving it fast, but doesn't interfere if you want a more precise shot. So I like the Hogplex, Leopold Freedom 1 to 4, one point. 1.5 to 4 whatever it is or if you want to step up to like their vx whatever series really really good optics rugged and i'm not sponsored by loophole uh, they're just really good american made scopes they're really rugged and I'll, I'll, unlike a lot of these taktaguchi type scopes they they're sleek and svelte they're not giant and obese and pregnant and they're really clear i would rather have a clear because i've done this i bought what i consider a junk scope a vortex strike eagle one to eight and i thought oh one to eight it'll be great one it was obese and two it looked like somebody spit a loogie and smeared it around on the front lens i almost immediately took it off and put a leupold one to four on it because i would rather have a clear four than a smeared disgusting looking eight power 
doesn't matter if the picture, if the th if the target's really big, but it's blurry, right? That's not a good compromise. I would rather have it smaller and crisp and clear. So anyway, with that, the one to six, I got no problem with it. We're fine. And it will be a good, good all around sight. Now for the AK-47. Here's a problem with the AK. It was not really designed to be shot with optics. There are optics mounting solutions on there. All of them I think are subpar, meaning none of them are as good as a decent flat top rail for an AR. And I think this is mostly happenstance. The AR-15 was designed pre-optics as well, but it just lends itself to a good flat top upper because the upper receiver is attached to the barrel and you don't have to remove it to clean it. As far as, I mean, you don't have to remove the top of the rifle to do maintenance like you do with the top cover of an AK-47. There's no real return to zero issues there. So any, there are several different ways to mount optics to an AK-47. <clears throat> and I'm thinking of a more traditional AK-47. But yeah, optics are a great force multiplier. And if you can get a good, and this is the caveat, if you can get a good solid way to actually, not you wish it would work, and it looks like a good idea, or it looks cool on Instagram, but it actually holds zero, and it actually is a good robust mounting system, if you can get that on an AK, you know, an optic on an AK is absolutely a force multiplier, just like it is on a AR-15, or a shotgun, or a pre-64 Winchester Model 70. Optics are a great force multiplier. So... Yeah, for sure. With the caveat, if you can get a really good rugged optics mounting system. This one's from North Hick 45. 308 versus 762 by 39 for Texas game. Like Whitetail and Wild Boar. I cannot decide between an AR-10 and an AK for the rifle I am planning to buy soon. I live in Hunton East Texas and want your opinion. All right, my opinion is get 308. This is a no-brainer. Get 308. What? Because... Well, because that's my opinion. You asked for my opinion. But no, seriously, let me expound on that a little bit. You're saving money sometimes if you get cheap plinking ammo for the 7.62x39 versus the 308. It's not a lot nowadays. It was back when we had a lot of cheap Russian surplus here on the market. It still is if you live in Canada. But for the U.S., there's not the price gap there used to be between cheap 308 and cheap 7.62x39. It's still a little bit cheaper. So if you're just plinking, if you if you ask me a different question, I might recommend 760 by 39. But if it's for hunting, no man, go 308 because you should not be hunting with cheap garbage Tula quote unquote hollow point ammunition that probably is not going to expand properly. You probably want a decent game bullet. If you're talking about decent, even like a generation old technology, simple cup and core. Um, Standard hunting loads like a Remington Core Lock or a Federal High Shock or a Winchester PowerPoint. What I would call like Briars Vanilla Walmart hunting loads. You're probably not saving any money. You might actually be spending more for 760 by 39 It's going to be less powerful, arguably potentially less effective. Not that it wouldn't be ineffective, but premium loads for 760 by 39 are as much or more than 308 So why? Why would you be doing that? And he didn't mention a crossover. He didn't mention this is his one gun for the peanut butter and chocolate hitting the fan. He said for hunting in East Texas. For hunting in East Texas, absolutely, to me, it's a no-brainer. Get the 308. Get a 308 and be done with it. it. It'll be good. If you're talking about decent hunting ammo, you're not saving anything by going to 762 by 39 Not to mention, if I had to, if I had to hunt, I not that you can't hunt with an AK, but I certainly don't. I would not choose to hunt with an AK over many other 308s, especially an AR-10. So for me, for those parameters, not that I would always choose that rifle over the other, but th again, this was specifically for hunting in East Texas. For hunting in East Texas, I absolutely would choose the 308. I hope that helped clear up the question there, North Hick. North Hick 45. How do I feel? Oh, this is from Todd Ruff. How do you feel about a Ruger AR-15? I think they're good, rock-solid budget guns. I think they're really good. I generally don't recommend them because I prefer the Smith & Wesson M&P. And not that I'm brand loyal to either one. I absolutely recommend some Ruger guns from time to time. They're great. I, I would say out of the two, I would pick Smith & Wesson M&P in that same price range. But the Ruger, the Rugers are fantastic. They made one years ago. I don't know if they still make it, but they made a piston one that was pretty good. 
but they're just regular, what I would call budget friendly. They're good. I have seen them need parts replaced, but I've also seen Colts that were run hard that need, needed parts replaced. I think for a decent budget beginner AR-15, they're a phenomenal choice. I would certainly take them over many of the other budget options. So on an AR-556, uh, a Ruger AR-556, I think they're great. I think they're probably in the top five of budget AR-15s that I would recommend. Ruger's a rock-solid company. I have ruined guns on my own stupidity and sent them back to Ruger and had them help me out. Ruger has always, in my opinion, had decent customer service. I would have no issues recommending a Ruger AR-556 for a beginner AR-15. This one's from Adam Vogus. What choke should be used in a home defense and combat shotgun? Well, those are, those are two completely different things, home defense or combat. Here's what I'm going to tell you. For home defense, the difference is academic. The difference does not matter. Chokes absolutely can make a difference, especially at extended ranges. But inside home, unless you live in a mansion, inside home defense distances, the difference in pattern between a full choke and a complete cylinder open bore is really academic. That The shot pattern takes a while to start opening up, whatever choke it is. <clears throat> so... Honestly, it makes no difference. And since it makes no difference, you may as well, and this is how many police shotguns and quote-unquote home defense shotguns come with just a cylinder bore. Since choke is not going to come into play anyway, why even bother? So if you have the option for a cylinder bore or improved cylinder, uh, either one of those, but it makes no difference, right? Because it's not coming into play. It would be like asking, what's the best long-range match ammo for my... 300 win mag for home defense. I'd say it doesn't matter because it's not going to matter at home defense distances. It's your plan outside those parameters. So for choke for home defense makes no difference. For a combat shotgun, you there's no there's no blanket answer for this, man. You have to test out of your gun what shoots best when fired by you. Buckshot, I assume if you're talking about a combat shotgun, you're most likely talking about buckshot and slugs. For that, you're probably limited to either modified or more open than modified. So modified, improved cylinder, skeet, cylinder bore, any of those. The reason I wouldn't go more than that is because most slugs require you to shoot them out of a modified or cylinder bore. At least that's what's recommended. You're not going to blow your gun up if you shoot them out of a full choke, but it's not good for the gun. So for that reason... Those are the chokes I would look at. You should test out of your gun when fired by you out of your preferred buckshot load, and your preferred buckshot load may change what you want. Now, I am going to recommend, because this works well out of many shotguns, that you try either Federal Flight Control or Hornady Versatite wads. Those are meant to perform really, really well in those kind of combat shotgun scenarios with that type of wad. And that wad performs best out of a more open choke, meaning cylinder, no restriction, or improved cylinder. And I think, in my experience, either cylinder bore or improved cylinder also does well with slugs. So what I'm going to tell you is, for a combat shotgun, either cylinder or improved cylinder. Which one? You need to test that, right? We could both go out and buy the Winchester standard vanilla load let's just say Winchester white box, nine pellet double up buck. And we could have two 12 gauge quote unquote combat shotguns of two different makes and models. And they could shoot crazy different with that same load. I might have acceptable keeping all my pellets on the chest side target at 40 yards. And you might be throwing pellets off a chest side target at 25 yards. That's how much of a drastic difference it can make. In which case you might, you might find that your pellets pattern better out of an improved cylinder or out of a modified and you're not really going to run slugs. It, it, don't take the lazy way out and just say, oh, well, Gunfighter Life said to run a mod choke, so I'm going to run a mod choke. It doesn't work that way. I know that slugs and buckshot generally come in five-round boxes. I think that's garbage. Go buy yourself a 25-round box of buckshot, buy you a bunch of different slugs, and go out and pattern your shotgun out of a few different chokes. I wouldn't go for a combat shotgun any tighter than modified. 
but I would run the buckshot because buckshot can perform very differently. Although in general, with birdshot, you will get tighter patterns with tighter chokes. That is not always the case with buckshot. You can get so tight that the pellets start doing weird things and they don't perform well at all out of tighter chokes. So you need to run buckshot and I would encourage you to try number four. It's my preferred buckshot even though double aught is the standard go-to. I prefer number four. You need to pick a couple of different loads. You might find, hey, Federal Flight Control shoots super well out of my shotgun, out of an improved cylinder choke, and it's the best group consistency with slugs. And I say rock on. I'm telling you that's what you should pick? No, because you have to test it. I don't know. You may find that your shotgun doesn't like that at all. You may find that your shotgun shoots both buckshot and slugs better with a straight cylinder bore. You have to test that out. So for home defense, it's academic. Might as well go cylinder bore. You don't, the restriction is not going to come into play. And for a combat shotgun, you have to test your shotgun when fired by you. But the big ones I would tell you to look at is cylinder bore, no restriction, improved cylinder, and modified. I would also really, really not overlook the type of shot. I would really encourage you to look at your performance with number four buck. And I would really encourage you to look at and dabble in flight control or versatite wads. The shotgun can be a very complex nut to crack. Don't think that it's as simple as, oh, well, you know, it, yeah, I'm just going to run modified choke. So I hope that helped. It's a more complex question than it seems. And I don't want to just say, oh, run improved cylinder. Because I run improved cylinder and I like that out of my shotgun. <laughs> All right. I don't know if this question is a joke or not. Uh, but Florian and nobody popped out of their mom's womb knowing about guns. So what is the fastest shooting sniper rifle? Well, I guess you'd have to define what sniper rifle is, but I'm going to say the Mob Deuce, the 50 cal machine gun. Why? Because Carlos Hathcock used it as a sniper rifle. It's a heavy machine gun, literally classified as a heavy machine gun. Since you don't have to hold it up, right? It's mounted on a tripod or a vehicle or something. It can be crazy accurate have a crazy long range, much longer than any shoulder-fired sniper rifle. Right, so a Modus, an M2, 50 cal machine gun. I'm the fastest firing sniper rifle. Done. S Sock the monkey. Okay, why are people saying AR-15 pattern rifles were designed for hunting? They can be used for hunting, sure, but they started life as select fire assault rifles. Um, okay, I don't think that that's true, and I'm not by any means a historian, but look into this. But A.R. Stoner, I believe, originally designed that type of rifle in his garage in 308 for his wife and himself to have sporting hunting rifles. And then later realized potential that it could be used in a military martial application. I could be wrong on that. By the testimony of two or three witnesses, a matter is established. I believe I've heard that from different sources. But look into that. I believe the A.R. Stoner... And what what is an AR-10? What is an AR-15? What were the prototypes? These are all questions you should look into for yourself. But I do believe that Eugene Stoner started developing those rifles in his, literally like his home garage or his shed for himself and his wife to have hunting rifles. So I do believe they actually were designed as a hunting rifle, as a lightweight hunting rifle option with the aerospace, because he had an aerospace background, and then realized they may have a martial application for the military so it depends on how far you want to roll back that clock if you're talking about the very first m16 then yeah the very first m16 was designed for the military if you're talking about ar-10s you know the early 308s i think he developed those as a hunting rifle and made them less powerful for use for the military um and again you i'm not a historian i didn't you know sit down and have tea and biscotti with Eugene Stoner, but you, you do that research for yourself. Adam answers uh, one of the older ones I had. What's your go-to carry gun? He said a car PM9. That's one of the old school, if you don't know, one of the old school slim, what you might call today a slimline micro 9. But a micro 9 before micro 9s were cool. Uh, the car PM9. Old school there. Gustavo. Han Zofo. Long-time listener, what are your thoughts on pencil barrels? Which one would you recommend? Great show, keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Gustavo. I think pencil barrels are probably the best for most people if we're talking an AR-15. Here's why. You're probably not running full auto. 
The pencil barrel is just fine, even for limited full auto use. I think the government profile barrel is one of the stupidest things that most civilians could get on an AR-15. That said, they're probably the most popular. Why? Because I guess because of Hollywood and video games and people see that and they think that's what they want. But those were designed for full auto and an M203 grenade launcher, neither of which apply to you. So I think the government profile is the stupidest profile that you could get. And it's sadly the most common. If I had a really great rifle that had a government profile barrel and it shot really well, I'd probably be fine. Whatever. I've certainly run those, especially with my background, but they make no sense if you don't need them. If you're not running an M203 grenade launcher, you don't need to cut out. If you're not running full auto, you don't need a heavier barrel. The pencil barrel was the original barrel adopted with the original M16. It's a fantastic barrel profile. I think it's the best barrel profile because it saves weight. Unless it's a specialty purpose AR, you could make the case if it's a special purpose rifle or recce rifle, you may want like a medium contour barrel or something like it. But I think for most people, a pencil barrel is the best profile. I wish they were more common. Uh, so I really like them. I think they're fantastic. I, I don't think most people are running, even if you're running limited volume full auto, they're fine. If you are running sustained like full auto, like you're pushing into a squad automatic machine gun type role like the like the marine corps does with their their uh newer squad automatic weapon yeah for sure you don't want you don't want a pencil profile barrel for that but if you're talking about a semi-auto good light handy carbine yes pencil profile all the way would you recommend a 1911 for self-defense and range gun i don't yeah i mean 1911 is a good solid staple i like 1911s I would ironically recommend it as not a first gun. Here's the, here's the reason why. Talk a 1911, and there's nothing I don't think wrong with a 1911 and 9mm. Actually, I have more 1911s in 9mm than I do in 45, if you count 2011s. But here's the thing. If it's a first handgun, you're going to want... The most important thing is not what gun you have. The most important thing is how much you train with it. And you're going to be able to train more and shoot more and practice more and go to more shooting competitions, more training classes with a 9mm. 9mm is the de facto defensive handgun caliber of our time, like it or not. I'm not saying there's not a time for other calibers. There certainly are. I was rocking a 357 today. I mentioned that earlier. But 9mm is the de facto standard. If it's for a first handgun, you should get 9mm and you should get something... Unless you are really good at being a mechanic. Like if you change your own oil, you do your own tune-ups on your car, you can change drum brakes, stuff like that. I got no problem recommending a 1911 to you. You can probably completely strip down and reassemble a 1911. If you are the guy that, and I'm not putting you down, I'm just saying this is a lot of the newer millennials and stuff. If you're the guy that doesn't change your own oil, don't cook unless you have a recipe, you don't. Like, if you have a problem with your lawnmower, instead of trying to fix it, you take it somewhere, you probably not serve well by a 1911. They're much more complex than most more modern handguns. That's one of the beautiful things about the handgun development. If you look at the amount of moving parts in a 1911 versus something like a Smith & Wesson M&P, which has very similar ergonomics, it has way simpler disassembly and moving parts and requires less maintenance. If it's for a first handgun, no. If you are already familiar with handguns and or you're a good mechanic, get a 1911 and 9mm, fine. If you already train a ton and you have a situation where you might want a bigger, heavier, slower bullet, or you live in a, or you travel into a state where you are neutered by the government to a very infringy magazine capacity, you could make the case that 45 makes more sense there. Uh, I think 45 is a phenomenal gun. I think if you are a really good shooter, you can really leverage the the beautiful trigger and the great drivability of a 1911. But going back to if it's your first handgun or maybe your first serious handgun, I, I don't think it's the wisest of choices. That being said, they are phenomenal handguns. So I don't know and I don't know your situation. So no, if it's a first handgun, it wouldn't be my first choice. If it's your, like your first serious fighting defensive handgun... If it's not, and you're already well-trained, and you are really good with a handgun, and you want to leverage the beautiful nature and ergonomics and trigger that is a 1911, yes. So, 
This is in response to, and I kind of had to read into this because it's two words to the question, but this is on the 9mm Nerds episode, and it says, mm, bullets. Uh, I assume that's what bullets are good for the 9mm, and that's kind of like asking, uh, what vehicle should I drive? Like, I, I don't know. I don't know you. I don't know your purpose. Like, there's a big difference between a Ford F-150 and a Ford Fiesta. <laughs> right both are Fords both are automobiles both are eternal combustion engines but what what are you doing and this I'm going to go back to kind of like what I said about the shotgun which is best for you to go to the range and run both not all handguns like all 9 millimeter loads not even all Glocks believe it or not like all 9 millimeter loads my wife's Glock 42 would absolutely shoot fine with some loads and some loads it was absolutely not reliable and I'm not just talking about when my wife shot it I'm talking about just it wasn't a limperous issue or anything. It was a literal failure to fire on some really good quality ammo loads. It just didn't like those loads. So you need to test it for you. Just and listen to me if you haven't if you've tuned out this entire episode driving to work. Listen now. If you run your 115 grain Winchester white box or LAX ammo or whatever the dirt cheap bargain basement ammo you can get, hopefully not Tula, but if you're slumming it. Don't run that through your gun and assume it's good and then load it up with something like 135 grain plus P FBI load. Not that that's a bad load, but you have no idea whether that's going to run in your gun. Also, that was designed for a full-length barrel. You may not be running a full-length barrel in your defensive handgun. And there's no guarantee it's going to feed. And especially if you're running 115 grains, there's no... In fact, it would be a mathematical anomaly if it shot the same point of aim, point of impact as your 115 grains. Don't be that guy. You are trusting not only your life, you're not only rolling the dice with your life, but you're rolling the dice with a bunch of other people's lives too. You're the guy that's going to stop an active shooter. Where's your defensive ammo going to shoot? Oh, I don't know. I was too busy shooting Tula ammo, and then I loaded up with 135 grain plus P because my favorite gun tuber said it was awesome ammo. Don't be that dude. You need to test your ammo. Does it shoot point of aim, point of impact when fired out of your gun by you reliably, consistently? That being said, I don't think there's any giant advantage over different bullet weights. I prefer 147s. That said, 115s are more common. You get, you, do you want a lighter bullet moving faster? Or do you want a heavier bullet moving slower? And I, there's people that I really respect that land on the 115 grain side. But you decide for you. Does it shoot reliably by you and fired out of your gun? Does it shoot point of aim, point of impact? Because different ammo will shoot different points of aim, point of impact, especially in the more traditional browning tilting barrel system. Less so in like a Beretta PX4 Storm or a barrel or Beretta dropping block system. They seem to be less affected by that. But for most common handguns, there can be a vast difference in point of aim, point of impact with different kinds of ammo. So that's a real complex question. I would refer you to an episode that I did on go to 9mm loads if you're talking about defense. And that is the last new question, unless I'm missing some, for the day. And that, I think, may be the most questions I've had. I appreciate you guys. I, I really do. I really do appreciate all the questions. I am humbled and blessed that you come here for an opinion. And if I came down a little bit hard on you, get out of this whole, like, flower-powered, wishy-washy, wet-noodle kind of love thing. Love is not telling somebody whatever they want to hear. Love is being honest. You shall speak the truth in love. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear if what I'm telling you is going to get you killed or potentially going to get you killed or is just wrong or stupid. I'm not going to do that. It may not be a stupid question, but I can certainly give you a stupid answer. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. No. Hopefully you don't come here for that. I love you too much to give you some garbage, wet noodle, beta male answer. So hopefully you appreciate the honesty here. And I don't fault anybody. People have all different experience levels when it comes to guns. Nobody popped out of their mama's womb, including me, shooting a gun. We all learned it along the way. And it's easy when you know more to forget or to roll your eyes at somebody that doesn't know as much. But that's not cool because you learned it sometime too. All the talent, skills, abilities we've been given are blessings. What do we have that we did not first receive? Well, hopefully I balanced that today and gave you some good information. If you want to ask a question... Uh, these are all Spotify submissions, and it's pretty even split between Spotify and iTunes, how many listens and stuff I get. But if you normally listen, you, and you want to ask a question, just go to Spotify and ask a question on there, even if you normally listen on something else. But these are Spotify questions. If you want to 
ask a question. And if you enjoy this content, and especially if I answered a question, if you're not a patron, really just consider, right, if I took the time to to give you this information, hopefully you'll take the time to like, subscribe, leave a review, hit some stars. I would appreciate that. Also, don't forget to share the show with people you think will enjoy it. And the show is just kind of one part of this. There's a whole other world going on on Patreon that you're missing out on. So if you want to become a patron, there's an insider chat. Like, people in the insider chat generally get their questions answered in a day or so. And I take Sabbath off and rest. In general, I answer their questions on the daily. So if you don't want to wait a month to have your question answered, have more in-depth questions, you might consider becoming a patron. Also, they get Patreon-only content. Like, episodes you're never going to get. You're just not going to do it. Because they're for patrons over there on Patreon. So, for those reasons, mostly because you appreciate the intel and you appreciate the show and you want to support it, consider becoming a patron. There should be a Patreon link in the show notes. With that, your tactical tip of the day. You carrying a gun? You should be. Are you a man? Do you have man parts? Do you live in America? Carry a gun like a man in America. But also carry a tourniquet. There are several different kinds of tourniquets. The kind of go-to, the best tourniquet in general for in general for an adult human being is a cat tourniquet. That being said, I don't EDC a cat tourniquet because they're kind of big and unwieldy. But I do EDC a tourniquet. For a long time, I EDC'd a rat tourniquet. And now I EDC a SWAT T tourniquet. They both have advantages. They both can be used on kids and dogs, whereas a cat sometimes cannot. But they're also sleeker and svelter. I carry a SWAT T in my back pocket. It's about the size of a wallet. I also carry a wallet, but I carry a SWAT T back there as well. Right? It's It can also be multi-use, which is why I kind of switched from it from the rat. The rat is kind of a decent, not as good as a cat, but a decent tourniquet. The SWAT T can be used as a bandage if you know how to use it. It can be used for all kinds of survival things. Basically, a, for lack of a better term, a giant exercise rubber band. You can use it as a pressure dressing. You can use it for all kinds of things. You can use it for all kinds of survival applications as well. I suppose you could strip it and braid it and make really strong bungee cordage out of it if you needed to. That being said, carry a tourniquet. If you're carrying a gun, carry a tourniquet. That's your tactical tip of the day. If you want something sleeker and smaller, the cat is the standard. But if you want sleeker and smaller than that, look at the rat tourniquet. Uh, for years, I carried one of those because I carry generally a full-size fighting handgun on my strong side. And on my support side, I'll carry a spare magazine. And in a second magazine pouch, I carried a rat tourniquet. It fits it fits swimmingly in a, magazine, a pistol magazine pouch. Now I carry the SWAT T in my pocket. Either one is good. But if you're looking for a smaller svelter tourniquet, go that way. You can do the ankle med kit. I don't generally like ankle stuff. I'm fairly active. I don't like sitting down. If I was like a trucker or did a lot of driving or something like that, ankle kit, okay. But but uh, that's also an option. But carry a tourniquet. Your tactical verse of the day. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You see a pretty distinct split in the road there, a bifurcation. Which one of those categories, men, are you in? Are you in the fold? Are you one of the chosen? All the talk about gun stuff, don't forget about what's really important. You win every gunfight you're ever in, and you die of old age in your bed and die and go to hell, you failed. Wrong answer. Remember what's really important. Thanks, and have a blessed day.